السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, إن شاء الله today we will continue talking about back propagation we uh, went through the main concepts of how to compute the gradients using back propagation right uh, so we, we saw that uh, on different examples um, how we will do the forward pass where we uh, we compute the actual values until the uh, the output and then uh, in the backward pass uh, we uh, we compute the local derivatives. Actually, we can also do it in the in the forward pass. Uh, and then we um, we uh, by the chain rule we can compute the derivatives up to the uh, the inputs and, and all the parameters. Um, we did that generally for general functions. Uh, and uh, at the end of the last lecture, we saw a function that looks like a general function, but we saw that it is actually the sigmoid function. Right, and that was a start, a starting point to uh, focus on neural networks. So today, inshallah, we'll focus uh, exclusively uh, on how backpropagation is done or is used for uh, neural networks. Um, so recall that training in neural networks has these two components: uh, backpropagation and gradient descent. Backpropagation is not actually used for training i mean it's not it's not doing the training it's just computing the gradients right and as we saw it can compute the gradients for any function so the backpropagation algorithm is not for training it's just for computing the uh, the derivatives or the gradients but we use that for training uh, in addition to the optimizer uh, which is gradient descent or its variance uh, we'll continue uh, with two hands-on exercises the first one uh, we want to use the backpropagation for uh, backpropagation algorithm for cross entropy loss function of a network of three outputs. So we have a neural network that has uh, three outputs F1, F2, and F3. Okay, and uh, we will we want to uh, to show how backpropagation will be used to compute the derivatives with the risk of the loss function with respect to each one of these three outputs. Okay, so forget about the network. Think that you have three outputs of the network, F1, F2, and F3. And from that, we want to compute the loss. And we want, uh, using backpropagation, to compute the derivatives of the loss with respect to each of these three outputs. I want you now to take a couple of minutes to do it uh, uh, manually, yourself. And then, inshallah, we will uh, we will do it together. Okay, so it's a cross entropy loss function. We have three outputs: f1, f2, and f3. The first thing to do is uh, is to draw the computational graph. Okay, so I want you now to think how we can draw a computational graph for this, starting from the three outputs up to computing the loss value. Hmm. So what is the loss for such network? Now we have three outputs, okay? So this is a multi-class classification problem. So we have, we have three outputs. So how can we compute the loss? It's cross entropy loss, right? So the loss, if you remember, the loss was the minus log of yi. Okay, so we need from the output, from the row outputs, which are, which are f1, f2, f3, we need to compute the softmax values and then take the log of whatever the correct label is. Okay, so how can we start with that? What is the input of that computation graph? F1, F2, F3. So F1, F2, and F3. Okay, now, next, what should we compute? We should compute the softmax value of each one, right? So how can we compute the softmax value of each one? Exponential, okay, so the exponential of each one, right? Yes. 
Yes. It's the output of the network, but the input of this part of the computational graph. Because we need to compute the loss. Okay, the loss is computed from the output of the of the network. So uh, so we need to compute the exponential for each one, right? Is that now the 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 softmax value of each? Very good. So we need to add them all, right? We need to add them all. Then after we add them, yeah, so we, we need to invert them, right? So that we can multiply by, by the one over that sum. So we need to invert them. And then multiply this value by this. This will give us the softmax of F1, right? So this is soft softmax of F1. And um, and if we take this, then this is softmax of F2 and the third one is softmax of um, so this is multiplied by by this one okay, so that's softmax of F3 Right? Any question up to this point? No. Okay, then what is remaining? Now we computed the softmax values. Okay, what is remaining to be computed? The, the loss, right? The loss value. The loss. We will still we, we want to get up to the loss. Okay, so the loss is computed by minus log, and then what is yi? yi is one of these three no yi is the label the actual the correct label okay so actually the loss is um so let me make it a little bit bigger so it's minus log a specific value right depending on yi so it, it will select one of these three based on yi. So it's minus log yi hat, which so this is this is y1, this is y1 hat, this is y2 hat, this is y3 hat, okay, and all of these three will be input to this in addition to so we need to have these three values and something else to compute the loss we need the correct label right we need yi right so another input here is yi so yi tells us which one of these three outputs is one for this input for the input xi. What's the correct label? Okay, so yani, for example, if this is, let's say, Masan, this is 0.4, and this is 0.5, and this is 0.1, and let's say, Masan, y3, yi is 3, or i is 3. Okay, that means that the loss is minus log of what? Minus log, minus log, point 0.1, which is the output, the softmax value of the of the third output. So we need to know the correct label, and we need to know the three values, so that we can select one of them based on the the correct one and compute minus log of that value. Okay, what is the output here? How can we we uh, call it? What's the output here? The loss, okay, the loss. 
Okay? Is that clear? Because this is the first time to do it. Okay? But this is how it compu it is computed, right? We have to compute the, the softmax values, right? For the three uh, outputs. And then from the, the softmax, va soft, softmax values, we compute the loss. Come on, we have to get also the correct label. Type. What remains now is to compute backpropagation, the, the derivatives, is to use backpropagation. Can we compute the derivatives here? What do we need to compute the derivatives? The, the, the local derivatives for each gate, right? And then the, by the chain rule, we can, we can compute any derivative, right? So do we know how to compute the local derivative for the exponential? Yes, it is exponential. 1 over x? Uh, multiplication? It's swapping. Uh, addition? Ones. Okay. Minus log? Log. What is the, the, the local derivative for log? 1 over x, right? It's minus 1 over x in this case. Because it's len here. Right. So, and then multiply it to, to get the, uh, the loss. Come on, this is, this is just the part of the network at the output, starting from the output. Okay, yani the actual network is where, is here. <laughs> okay, so we can back propagate to whatever we want to compute the, uh, the depth. Actually, we'll see something like that in the second, in the, in the, in the next exercise. Okay, any question about this exercise? One thing here I want to, uh, to emphasize. We can compute the local derivative here, right? Right? We can compute the local derivative here, right? We can compute the local derivative here, right? Type, what is the local derivative for, the, for this now? Because this is branched, right? It has three branches. What will be the, the derivative here? No, actually the, the, the sum of them. Logi and it is logical. This one, this output, affects the loss in three paths, right? So the overall effect is the addition, is the sum of all of these effects, right? Now the derivative is, what is the meaning of the derivative? If it's changed, how it will affect the, the, the output, right? So it will affect the output, so this value here, changing it will affect the output in three different patterns. Okay, so the, the total effect is the sum of them. So any branching, actually, we need to sum the derivatives. Okay, so the next exercise, um, here we want to draw the, the, the computational graph for a network. We have a binary classification uh, um, a model with a shallow network of two hidden units two inputs, and sigmoid activation function. So we want now to, to draw the computational graph for the entire uh, network up to the loss, from the input to the loss. Okay, so binary classification, two hidden units, two inputs, and sigmoid activation function. Type, how can we start with that? Okay. For this specifically, it's better to start by drawing the network itself so that we can understand how we can comp we can draw the computation graph. So what is the network here? We have two inputs, right? So let me write, let me draw it here. We have x1 and x2, right? And then we have how many? Uh, two hidden units and how many outputs? Just one output. So yeah, so it will be like that. Okay. And let, let's let's uh, let's write the weights here. So let's, this is the W1, W2, W3, W4, and let's say and this is W5, and this is W6. What else? The biases, right? So let's say this is B1, this is B2, and that's B3. Okay. Type. Now, now we can do. We start to draw the the computational graph. How can we start? With the output. Why? With with the inputs. Right. 
uh, not exactly because this is not computational graph. This is the neural network, right? So we need to convert that into computational graph. So we need the gates now has to be operations. So we have x1, okay. So what should we? How how can we start now? So we have the two inputs, right? What else? The weights and biases, right? Okay. So how many? So what what is the first level of the computations that we will do? What are the first first level of gates? Multiplications, right? Yes. So how many multiplications we will have? Hmm. How many multiplications? Four, right? Four. So we have multiplication, multiplication. Okay, the first one, x1 with with w1. Then x1 with w2. So we put w2 here. Then x2 with w3, so w3 here, and x2 with w4, okay, then, then the addition, we will add w1 x1 with w1 x1 plus, plus, x1 w1 plus x2 w3 what is x2 w3 is here right and and we add b1 very good and um, x1 w2 x2 w4 plus B2. Okay. Then, why maximum? Ah, the activation function. The activation functions are all here, sigmoid. Okay. So, where we should add them? After the addition. Right. So, sigmoid. Sigmoid. Two, right? Why we have two? Yeah, because we have two two hidden uh, units, right? Okay. Then, so this is now like H1 and H2. Okay, then uh, multiply by W5 and W6, right? So H1 with W five and H two with H two with W six. Then then we sum them. We add B three, very good. Then Then we need to get up to the uh, the the loss function, right? So after we after we add them, what what's that value? This is the output, right? That's the output value, the raw value of the output. What should we do to compute the loss? It's binary classification. So what do we do with the output? So we apply first the sigmoid, right? So we apply the sigmoid function so that, so that we get we get a probability, and then from that we compute the loss. So the loss will be again minus log, whatever bad the, the correct label is. Okay, it's either minus log this value or minus log one minus this value. Okay, based on. So let's say minus log here. 
my hat okay depending on what is y y i hat here again the label has to be also an input right okay is that clear and now what is this the loss okay now we can compute of course the forward pass if if we know the values of x of the current model and the values of the inputs uh, then we can do the forward pass and then we can do the backward pass, right? So the backward pass, do we know all the local derivatives? Yes, we know the local derivatives for each of these gates, right? Including the sigmoid. We know how to compute the, the local derivative for the sigmoid and the addition and the multiplication and everything, right? Okay, any question about this? Is that easy or hard? Hmm. Ah, here. Yes, here is the network here. Yes. Yes. Here. <laughs> yes, exactly. But here it was binary. If it was, if it would be if it would have been uh, multi-class, then we have three outputs. Then we will plug in what we had in the previous previous exercise here. Okay. Any questions? Was that easy or hard? Any after you are, you understand what's going on, I think it's very easy, right? And straightforward. It takes time, of course, to compute all of these things manually, but it's it is straightforward. I, I I assume that you already understand how how we do that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What what will change here if we have different activation function? Yeah, these gates will be different. How about this one? No, this one is because we have a sigmoid activation function or because it's binary classification problem? Because it's binary classification. Okay. If we have multi class classification here, that wouldn't be sigma, it wouldn't be sigmoid, it would be soft mass. And you saw how we implement soft mass in the previous exercise. Okay, any questions on that? So that was, yani, I think, uh, a closing exercise on the basic principles or concepts of backpropagation. Okay, I assume now that you can really compute backpropagation for any function, for any network. Okay, assuming that you know how to compute the local derivatives. Okay, now we need to see how this is actually done, implemented in reality. How backpropagation will be actually used for neural networks you will see you will see that we don't compute the derivative for every single variable by hand okay we actually do that automatically as as you will see so um if you remember at one point i think maybe three or four weeks ago we said that the equations of the neural network can be represented as matrices and vectors right Right, remember the weights are in, in, in matrices and the biases are in vectors, and even the pre-activations and the um, the hidden units are just vectors. Right? Even the input and the output are vectors. So to do back propagation over these representations, we need to know how to do that over we need to do to know how to do derivatives over matrices and vectors. And this is what we call matrix calculus. Okay, matrix calculus. It's it's very uh, easy, but we need to understand how we do it. Time. First example of matrix calculus. If we have a function, and that function is a function of multiple variables, 
and these multiple variables can be represented as a vector. So we have a function f. Oops, sorry. Oops. So we have a function f, and that function is a function of all of these values. So we can say that it's a scalar function, which means that it will return one value, but it's a function of a vector because it's a function of multiple variables. Okay? In that case, we can represent the derivative of the function with respect to the vector by a vector. Each element of it is the derivative with respect to one single element of that vector. So we have a1, here we have df by da1, and then df by da2, and, and so on, okay? So the function is a scalar, it's a function of multiple variables, it's a vector, so the derivative will be also a vector. This is easy, right? That's straightforward, right? Time. Now, what if the function is not a function of a vector, it's a function of multiple variables that are represented in a matrix? Again, it's it's the same. It's similar to what we saw in the previous slide. Now, the derivative with respect to that matrix will be a matrix where each element is the derivative of the function with respect to the corresponding element in the matrix. So, df by da, the first element here is a11. You will see that here the first element is df by da11, and then df by da12, which is the element here, and so on. So, element by element we will do the derivatives, okay? So nothing new here. It's just applying the function, which is scalar in our case, in, uh, on, on, uh, the, uh, we, we, uh, we, not we apply the function, we compute the derivative with respect to every element in a vector or in a matrix. And the outcome will be represented as a vector, uh, as the previous slide, or a matrix in that slide. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions? Sure? Okay. Easy? Type. Now, what if we have a vector function? What do we mean by a vector function? Multiple functions. We have multiple functions. We, we don't have just one function. We have multiple functions. So we have f1 here, f2, and f3. And each one of them is a function of multiple variables. So each one of these functions is a function of the vector a. Okay? So we have functions, multiple functions, and we have each function of them is a function of these four values, for example. Okay? And now we want to compute the derivative of f, which is a vector, with respect to a, which is another vector. Before we see how we, we compute that, let me tell you Yanni, how is that related to what we are, we are doing. Okay. Remember in the neural network, we have, let's say, Masan, this is a hidden unit. Okay. And the previous unit, previous hidden unit, has four neurons. Okay. So, if I want to compute the pre-activation value here, it's a function of all of these, right? Right? It's a function of all of these. So this is F1. It's a function of all of these values, right? Weighted sum, but it's a function, right? Same here. F2 is a function of all of these four, right? F3 also is a function of, of all of these four, right? So this is what we are saying here. We have three <clears throat> functions. Each one of them is a function of these four values. Now, if I want to compute the derivative of f with respect to a, it will be a matrix. Okay? The first column of it is the derivatives of the first function with respect to all the values here. So this is df1 by da1 df1 by da2, df1 by da3, and so on. So all the derivatives in the first column are the derivatives of the first function with respect to all the elements. And the second column is the derivatives of f2 with respect to all the elements, and the third one is f3. 
Okay, and this is how we represent this derivative. So the derivatives now are not just single values, they are vectors or matrices. Okay, in this case, it would be a matrix to capture or to represent all the derivatives that we uh, that we can see. Okay, with me so far? And you know why we are doing that? Because we have this situation in, in, in neural networks, right? We have functions, and these functions are functions of different, um, sorry, we don't have this here, uh, function of different um, variables. Okay? Type. Now, as a concrete example, consider this function. F is a vector here. It has three functions again. A is a vector. It has four uh, elements. And F actually, and this is the exact function now, equals B times A. Now, F, what are the dimensions of F? Three by one. Three by one. Dimensions of A? Four by one. So what is B then? Three by four. Um, three by four, yes. Three by four. So it's a matrix. Right? Type. If I told you I want to compute DF by DA, from what you know from calculus, if you didn't know that these are matrices or vectors, what will be the outcome? What will be the derivative? DF by DA. B, right? B. That's every, if everything is scalar. Right? Nothing new here. Right? Except that these are not scalars. Okay? So now, if these are not scalars, then we need to think what will be the outcome. So the output actually will not be just a number. It will be a matrix. So if you just um, expand this notation, then each function of this is the multiplication of one row with, with the vector A, right? So this is three by four. So we have something like this times this, right? So this is, let's say this is B and this is A, right? So to compute the first function, this is the multiplication of this row with that column, right? Second function, this row with that column, and so on, right? So this is this is the uh, this is the actual functions. Now, if I want to compute the derivative as we saw in the previous slide, that will be columns, right? Each function has a column. Okay, so df1 by da1, df2 by a2, and and so on, and that's for uh, f2, and that's for f3. Uh, is that b? So let's let's see what is df1 by da1. So f1 is the multiplication of this. Let's say, mass, and then this is b11, b12, b13, b14. Okay. So it will be b1, right? Okay. So let's let's put it here. B1. So this is the value. This value, right? Type. Right. How about this value? df1 by da2. It will be b12. Sorry, this is b11. Sorry, okay, this is b11, right? So this one, this value will be. Now well, this is okay. This is a1, a2, a3, a4, right? So f1 equals b11, a1 plus b12, a2, and so on. So df1 by da2 is. Okay, again, again. So what is what is F1? F1 equals B11, A1, plus B12, A2, plus B3, B13, A3, plus B14, A4. So, right? So DF1 by DA1 is B11. DF1 by DA2 is B12. And then, and then, df1 by da3, b1, b1, 3, and then b1, 4, okay, and, and so on. 
what, what's happening here? It's actually the transpose of V. So this is the first, that was the first row of B. Now it is a column. Okay. And then you will see that this column will be here. And so on. So instead of B, that would be actually B transpose. Okay, are you with me? So in, in if, if these are scalars, it will be B, but because of this notation matrix vector notation, that will be B transpose. So that's not B, it's B transpose. Okay? Still easy, but you just need to visualize it. <laughs> okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So remember that when we have a matrix like that, to get the derivative, it will be the transpose of the matrix. Okay? Right. This is just a comparison. When we have the scalar values, F3 equals beta 3 plus W3 H3, if we take the derivative with respect to H3, it will be just W3, right? So that's W3. But if these are matrices and vectors, so beta 3 plus omega 3 H3, when we take the derivative of F3, which is this, with respect to H3, what would be the outcome? The transpose of omega 3. Okay, the transpose of omega 3. Okay, now, does this remind you of something? This equation, did you see it before? Did you see? Did you see something like that before? Huh? That's the pre-activation uh, values, right? That's the weighted sum plus bias. Right? So this is these are the biases, and these are the weights. These are the hidden units of the previous layer, and thus this is the pre-activation values. Okay. So we need to compute the derivative, right? Of such operation. Okay? So it would be a matrix like that. Okay? You link it now what we uh, what we are uh, uh, discussing with what we need actually. Okay. Type we will see the link anyway, but I think you can now imagine the link. Okay. Type. Now back propagation action. We are ready now to see how back propagation is used in implementation, not on paper. But we really needed to do it on paper anyway, right? Huh? But you couldn't understand it if we didn't do it by hand. Okay? So you have to you have to do it by hand to understand how it is computed actually. But then in reality, we don't do it by hand, of course, and we don't do it even with single variables. We do it with respect to vectors and matrices, as you saw in the previous slides. Right. Now, let's see how backpropagation will be uh, will be done. Um, so that's <clears throat> let's assume that we have this network. We have one, two, three, four, um, actually three hidden uh, layers, and this is the output layer. This is the output layer, and that's the loss. Okay. And we want to apply back propagation on that. <clears throat> so the first thing is to do the forward pass, right? So the equations that you see here are the equations that I think you saw we saw three or four weeks ago when we said that we can represent all everything in the network by matrices and vectors, right? So this is the pre-activation at the first layer. This is the hidden unit. Uh, uh, vector at, at the first hidden layer and so on, right? Remember? So all of them, you can see that there are two kind of expressions here. The weighted sum, which is this one, right? The weighted sum plus bias and applying the activation function, which is this one, right? All of them are like that. It's weighted sum, apply the activation function. Weighted sum, apply the activation function and so on. So with that, we want to know how to compute the derivatives. That's what we want to do now. But remember that these are not scalars. So the biases are vectors or matrices, biases, vectors, 
and the omegas, the weights, no, weights are matrices. Weights are matrices between, between two layers, right? Okay. And how about the pre-activation functions, the pre-activation values? Vectors, right? Vectors. How about the loss? So the last thing here is the loss. The loss is a vector or a matrix? It's just one value. Okay, it's a scalar. It's not a vector, it's not a matrix, it's just one value. Okay, so it's a function of the last of the output values and the label. Okay. Time. So <clears throat> given that we we know the current model, we know the current values of the parameters and the input, we can compute all of this, right? We can compute the output value and the loss for that for that example. Right? Now what is remaining? To do back propagation, what should we do? The backward pass, right? This is the forward pass. We need to do the backward pass. Type the backward pass. We need to compute the derivatives, right? So the first thing is to compute the derivative. The last, you see this last equation, okay? We we will do the derivative step by step, right? Backward. So the first thing is to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the last the, the output, okay? That of course depends on the uh, on the the actual loss function. Okay, and we saw an example for the um, uh, binary classification. We saw example for, um, I mean, the uh, cross entropy, binary cross entropy, and multi class cross entropy. Time. One step back, we will compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the pre activation of the previous hidden layer. Okay, how can we do that with the chain rule? So we have the derivative of the loss with respect to F3, then DF3 by DH3, and then DH3 by DF2. Okay, backward. Right? And then one step further. Again, this is, this part is this whole thing. By chain rule, we multiply it by DF2 by DH2, and DH2 by DF1, and so on. Okay, so we can get back up to the beginning. Now, all of these are just derivatives, right? We need just to know how to compute the single one, single derivatives of these. Okay, the individual derivatives. And just then multiply them to get by chain rule to get the derivatives that we want. Fine, let's focus on one of them now. And we said that this one will depend on the loss function. Okay, so we will not be able to have a, a closed form here. It depends on the loss function, the exact loss function. Sorry? No, the loss, the perfect loss is zero. If if the output is correct, right? Yeah. But but anyway, it, it will depend on the, the exact loss function. Okay? So we'll assume that we know that. Alas? Now let's focus on this one. This is the Derivative of the um, pre-activation, right? Given the hidden units of the previous day, where is where is that relation? This is this is the one. You see this? F three equal beta three plus omega three h three. Okay, this is getting from the layer the 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 last layer, the one be before the last layer. That's the hidden units of the last layer minus one. And F3 is the pre-activations of the last layer. Are you following with me or not? So this is like, where, where is it here? You see here, this is the, <clears throat> this is the, the hidden layer. Actually, this is, sorry, this is the output. This is the output. F is the output. Okay. So F3 is the, is the output here. Is that, is the output at that output layer. And H3 are the hidden units of this hidden layer. Okay, what is the relationship? This is the relationship. That's the weighted sum. Right? Are you following with me? Now, what is DF3 by DH3? Uh, these are not scalars, right? Okay, these are uh, omega 3 transpose, yes, based on what we discussed. Right? So that's one 
if you remember, that would be omega-3 transports. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, you are basically uh, like deriving like a scalar in the back of the right? No, this is still a value. <coughs> this is one value. <coughs> okay. No, sorry, sorry. This is a scale. Yes, this is a scalar function of a vector. So that's actually this one is a vector. Okay, this value, this value is 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 one value. Yeah. Okay, it's a it's a function. It's one. It's it's a scalar function. Now we are applying it on f three, which is a vector. So this one actually is a vector. It's the loss with respect to each of the output values. Let's say, mesa f three here is two, right? This is. Uh, can you can you look at? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So these are two here, right? So we need to compute the loss. The derivative of the loss with respect to each one of these. So this is a vector. Okay. That's the very the the first slide in the matrix uh, calculus. If you remember, scalar of of uh, of a vector. Okay. Did I answer your question now? Okay. Now back here, df3 by dh3 is matrix or a vector. It's a matrix, it's a matrix which is. W3, uh, omega-3 uh, transpose. Yeah. Okay, so back here, it's it's omega-3 transpose. So now, now we have this. We have that. Let's look at this now. Okay, what is this? This is based on this, right? This is the hidden value as a function of the pre-activation values. So this is what? Applying, applying what? Applying the activation function, right? This is just applying the activation function on, on the the pre-activation values, right? This is just applying the activation function. Now we we always have two steps every every hidden layer, right? Weighted sum, apply the activation function. Weighted sum, apply the, right? So this is the weighted sum halas, and that's the activation function. Now if you think about, um, let's assume that the activation function is radio. Then what is the derivative? We talked about it before, right? The maximum of zero and, and the input. Or we can also say that it's the indicator function. Okay? Indicator function means it's one if that condition is true and zero otherwise. So if, remember, the, the radio itself is the max. But the derivative of it is either zero or one. Zero if it's below zero. And one if it's above zero, because it would be just the the, the value, right? Um, here it is z, so dz by dz is one. So the derivative is zero or one, zero if z is less than or equal to zero, and one if it's above zero. Okay, type. Now let's get back here. Now, H3 is a vector, right? Or, or a scalar? It's a vector. And F2 is a vector also. Remember, if a function, we have, so now we have a vector function and a vector input, yeah, uh, value, uh, inputs. Okay, so each function is a function of all of these uh, input values. So the output should be a matrix. Okay, so the output should be a matrix. So it's something like that. So this is A1. So um, here, this is just an example. Okay. So A is value of B. Both are vectors. So when we compute dA by dB, we have this matrix that we saw before. Remember, this is, it's like F1, which is A1 here. And this is for A2, and this is for A3, the derivatives. Okay. Remember that? We uh, think 10, 10 minutes ago. Fine. Now, to compute these um, values, let's look at this equation. This is this is how we compute actually the the, the activation values, right? Each, let's say, now we have three nodes. Before the activation value, this is b, b1, 
and this is a1 so a1 is ratio of b1 right and a2 is ratio of b2 and a3 is ratio of b3 type if i told you now what is the a1 by db1 is the indicator is the indicator right so that if i i will write it so it will be the indicator of whatever the condition right type what is what about da1 by db2 is a1 actually a function of b2 a zero why is it zero who said zero why it's not yeah it's because a1 is just one function of b1 it's not function of b2 or b3 so this is zero and that's zero also okay and that's zero and that's the indicator and that's zero so you will find that if only the diameter has non-zero values okay are you following with me on that right and in general yes everyone here can be a function of all of them but for this specific case and we do it one by one okay there is no weighted sum like uh, it's not a function of uh, all the variables no it's a function of one variable only okay each function is is, is a function is is a function of one variable so the derivative will be like that and what are these indicator values zero or one so this matrix is zeros and ones okay only the ones can appear in the diagonal actually okay so either we keep it like that with all the matrix zeros except the, the diagonal or to save memory what should we do we just keep the diagonal right we just keep the diagonal and in that case it won't be a matrix it won't fit with with multiplying with other matrix it will be just a vector that will be multiplied element by element okay so this is okay so let me then erase this and that's now the matrix or we can just uh, represent it by a vector that has these three elements okay and if we do that then we just multiply element by element pointwise with the next matrix okay so if we go back now now we we have we know this right from the loss function we did this before which is omega transpose right omega 3 transpose and now this is the the indicator function okay any questions so far yes imagine <laughs> so eventually yes this is exactly the message that i want to deliver here everything will be matrix multiplication and vector matrix vector multiplication we will not do by the single individual derivatives and and all of that okay but it came from that that's why we need to understand how it came from and of course this is halas now if we know these three halas this is the value here we do similarly these two things and then that will be the whole thing here and then we do similar things here and so on. okay so that's backwards okay type what remains if you look at these derivatives are actually these derivatives are the ones that we really care about look at look at this these values are these these are the derivatives that we want actually what are the derivatives that we want with respect to what the last one this one why do we care about this one okay when we when we compute back when we use back propagation okay back propagation can be used to compute the derivative everywhere right but do we actually care about the the values for everywhere or we care about the parameters we care only about the derivatives with respect to the parameters but why do we care about the, the derivative with respect to every parameter why we need to see that they're how sensitive to change to change them that's the model <laughs> okay that's the model the, these are all of these things are what are intermediate values that we need of course they are needed 
يعني we will not be able to compute the derivatives, the derivatives with respect to the parameters unless we compute these. But this is not the ultimate goal. That's what that's what I'm, I wanted to say. Okay, that's not the target. The target is to compute the derivatives with respect to the parameters. Did we do that here? No, not yet. This is with respect to the intermediate quantities or values. Then we need to compute with respect to the parameters. What are the parameters? Biases and, and, and weights. And the parameters are represented as matrices and vectors. Okay? So the first one, we'll, we'll start with the easiest one, actually, the biases. The, the, uh, the derivative of the loss with respect to the bias is the derivative of the loss with respect to the intermediate output uh, of the, of the pre-activation value times, the, the, which is computed in the previous slide already, times the derivative, which is the local derivative now, of the pre-activation with respect to the bias type. This is like what? This is like this equation. F1 equals beta 1 plus omega 1 H1. If I told you what is the, the derivative of F1 with respect to beta 1, it will be 1 if, if everything is scalar. Or I, the identity matrix, if it's not. Now, if you multiply the identity matrix with this, it would be nafs, the, the same thing. Allah? For the local derivative here is i, <laughs> nothing. Okay, so we don't need actually to multiply anything. Okay, what is remaining now? The weights. Next slide. No, no, okay, no. That doesn't mean that the, the derivatives are ones. It means that you will, the local derivative is once, so it will be multiplied by the derivative. Okay, which is this? Okay. Okay. The the local derivative is one. Okay. Type for the weights for the weights for the weights. Okay. Now back to this equation. If I told you this equation, okay, f1 equals beta 1 plus omega 1 h1, df1 by d omega 1 is what? Is h1 transpose actually, okay? So it's h transpose. Okay, so it will be multiplied by the previous one. Okay, again, this is a vector. This is a matrix. Okay, so again, it's vector matrix multiplication, eventually. And that's it. Halas, we are done. We, we got all the derivatives that we want. And we found that everything is just vector matrix multiplication. So in summary, this is the forward path. These are the equations that we saw before. Right? That's the, the computations. That's the forward path. Okay? What you see here, this, this uh, graph, is not the computational graph. It's just the, uh, the values that show the sequence of, of, the, uh, of the computations. So we, we compute, we have from x1, we compute f0, then we compute h1. So that's the sequence of computations. Okay? But these are not the gates. Yeah, the, the, the circuits here are not the gates. The circuits here are the values. Okay, and that's the sequence of computations. And in the backward uh, pass, from the loss, we compute the loss with respect to the previous pre-activation, and then the, the hidden unit, then the previous deactivation, uh, pre uh, previous pre-activation, and then the hidden unit, and so on until the input. That's the top row here, the top uh, part. The bottom part actually are the things that we are interested in which are the derivatives with respect to the weights and the biases. And as you saw, we need to compute this first, and then from that, we will compute this and that, and, and so on for the others. And these are the equations that we saw before. Okay, so that's the summary of what will happen in, in the backward pass. So all of these circles 
have to be computed. But all of them are just matrix vector multiplication or matrix matrix multiplication. Okay? Any questions? So here I'm just showing the steps that we need to, to do. Yani first, we will compute this derivative. Then from that, we can compute now the derivatives with respect to the beta 3 and omega 3 and, and so on backward until we reach the, the last thing. Okay, so we need to compute that by hand. We do we need to compute that even automatically, but with every single variable? It's in in batch, right? Okay, all the variables. This is this is the derivative with respect to all the hidden units, with respect to all the pre-activation values, with respect to all weights, with respect to all biases. Huh? Yes, of course, it's many values, but it's systematic process, right? It is systematic, it can be easily implemented, right? As long as we know how to implement matrix vector multiplication and matrix matrix multiplication, follows. with these equations, it's very easy to implement and to get the, uh, the derivatives, okay? So what is the advantage of this? The major advantage here of backpropagation this way is that it's very efficient. It's extremely efficient. Okay, with so many um, um, parameters, if we know how to do the, mat the matrix vector multiplications efficiently, then everything will be efficient. And we actually know how to do matrix vector multiplication very efficiently. And it's, it can be parallelized even. So it doesn't have to be sequential. Okay, so there is a lot of work for many years on how to make matrix vector multiplication or matrix matrix multiplications very efficient. Okay, type. How about batch processing? Yani now, if you remember, this whole thing will be done with, or should be done with every single training example in the batch, right? And yani remember this forward pass, it's, it starts with an example, right? One example. We have to do the forward pass and then backward pass to compute the, the loss, to compute the derivatives. And then we take another example in the batch. We do the same thing, right? Then take the third example of the batch. Do the same thing, right? Time. With every example of these, are these dependent on each other? Yani doing it for the first example. Doesn't, does it need the second example? Or the second example actually doesn't need the first example? No. Actually, these processes can be done in parallel. And that's actually is done. So within the example itself, the matrix, the multiplications of the matrices and vectors are done very efficiently. And also within the batch, computing the, the derivatives with each, with respect to each example, or with respect to the parameters for each uh, example, can be done in parallel. So overall, it is extremely efficient. Okay? You understand that now? Type. If it's very efficient, huh? Uh, okay, you said two things. You said two things. Will it take time and space? Okay. I, I answered that the first one, which is time. So if we have the computational power, everything will be very efficient. It will be parallelized and it will be very efficient. So it won't take much time. Okay. But of course, if I have billions of examples, so if I have a lot of training data, of course it will take time, but it is as efficient as possible. Okay? Now, the disadvantage is the second part that you mentioned, which is the space. What is What do you mean by space here? Memory. Does it need really a lot of memory? Why? Yeah, so we, we need to store first the model itself, which might be billions of parameters. And we need to store the intermediate values, right? All of these intermediate values has to be stored so that we can uh, uh, do the back propagation. And the for, for the forward pass, we need all the values in the forward pass has to be stored because they are used in the in the in the backward pass. Okay, so the model has to be fit in memory, has to fit in memory, and the intermediate values also has to fit in memory. If the model is so big, 
then we need a lot of memory. And that's what we are in nowadays. If the model is very big, you need really big memory. And nowadays, everything is done by GPUs. Uh, so it depends on how fast the GPU is and the memory of the GPU. It should fit whatever needed for one batch. Okay? Um, and then in the other batch, we will do it again and again. You had a question? Okay. Any questions on that? So it's extremely efficient, but it's memory hungry. Okay, it needs a lot of memory. So it must store the intermediate quantities and also it's not just the intermediate uh, uh, values, it's the it's the model itself, which is yes. Okay, so the, the weights and biases also have to be um, have to be uh, uh, stored. Um, as we mentioned earlier, earlier in the uh, in the course, the parameters now are in terms of billions. Okay, and billions parameters. Each parameter is a floating point number, right? So it needs like four or eight bytes to store. So that's a lot. Okay, you can compute. You can see how much memory we will need to uh, to store something like that. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so we'll stop here, and inshallah, next uh, next lecture we'll talk about um, how it's done actually in primitive. So we'll see we'll see some code, okay, to see how how that is done, and we also talk about inshallah uh, parameter initialization. Okay, thank you.